The first time Jalen Rose met Chris Webber, they were 12. Jalen told Chris, You've got the sorriest game I've ever seen. And the way Rose describes it, he and Webber should have been rivals from that moment on. While Jalen was taking two public buses across town at dawn to attend Detroit's Southwestern High School, Chris was starring at the much fancier Detroit Country Day Private School. Rose was a well-regarded prospect, but Weber got more hype, as well as Michigan's Mr. Basketball title, by a wide margin over the second place Rose. Envy could have come between them. Instead, when Weber signed on to join the University of Michigan's legendary 1991 recruiting class, Rose followed him because the two had become such close friends. Chris and Jalen stayed tight throughout college, but the end of their wild ride at Michigan and the extremely complicated legacy of the Fab Five recruiting class has driven them apart. The seeds of this beef were planted in the early 90s. It took almost 30 years to reach full bloom. Beef grows on trees, I guess? I don't know who writes this garbage. Anyway, Rose and Weber were the two Michigan-born members of the Fab Five, a Wolverines lineup that revolutionized the style and structure of college basketball, made important statements about amateurism and capitalism, and was, you know, really good at sports. The feisty point forward and the smooth yet thunderous big man were leading scorers on a squad that made back-to-back -back NCAA finals under coach Steve Fisher. Weber became the first pick in the 1993 NBA draft, at the time a rare and impressive honor for an underclassman. He'd go on to an excellent pro career, earning his first All-Star selection in Washington, where he played alongside fellow Fab Fivesman Juwan Howard. He then rose to truly elite status in Sacramento before knee injuries slowed him down. Rose, like Howard, went pro after junior year and became a 94 first-round pick. He had some very good years on some very good Indiana Pacers teams. Weber and Rose both left the league in the late 2000s and both quickly transitioned to television careers that are still going strong. It sounds simple when you paint it with broad strokes. It sounds like they should still be friends. But we've neglected some stuff. One crucial thing happened, and most of what I just told you officially didn't happen. And it all has to do with Chris Webber. Thing number one, the timeout. Michigan's 1992 NCAA tournament run was an exciting surprise. They were a six seed with five freshmen as starters, and while losing to Christian Leitner, Grant Hill, and the Duke Blue Devils in the final did hurt, people were mostly thrilled that the Wolverines made it that far. 93 was different. Michigan entered March Madness a favorite, and upon reaching the final, they fully believed they would take down fellow one seed North Carolina. But, down two in the closing seconds, Weber committed a now infamous infraction. Well, first he traveled, but that didn't get called. After that, Weber dribbled up court, got trapped right in front of his own bench, and attempted to call a timeout even though Michigan had run out of them. The resulting technical foul extinguished any hope of Michigan winning at all. Coach Fisher and Weber's teammates were quick to console their star big man, and they insisted he wasn't the reason they lost that they wouldn't have even had a championship to lose if not for Weber's brilliance. But Weber clearly took the collapse hard. The scenes of him walking off the court and facing the media afterward are painful to watch. And there wasn't much time to resolve this grief. Weber boldly declared for the draft just weeks later. I decided to turn pro. Um, just decision that I felt was necessary for me to keep going and to move on. He began his career with the Golden State Warriors while the remaining four stars played another season at Michigan this time falling in the Elite Eight. So that's thing one. Thing two didn't hit Weber until years later, and it may have never hit if not for a car accident that had nothing to do with him. In February 1996, star recruit Mateen Cleves visited Michigan, and the team's stars took him out on the town. Returning from a party, Maurice Taylor lost control and rolled his SUV, breaking the arm of teammate Robert Trailer and sparking an investigation as to what the Wolverines had been up to that night with a recruit in tow. An inquiry by the NCAA and the university didn't reveal anything monumental, but later reports uncovered that the players had been at the home of well-known Michigan booster Ed Martin, which led to further investigations and eventually Steve Fisher's firing. Then the feds stepped in and discovered that Martin was running an illegal gambling operation and had made payments over the years to several Michigan prospects and athletes. Subpoenas led numerous players, coaches, and their family members to testify before a grand jury in 2000. 
Rose, like some others, admitted to accepting small amounts of cash from Martin, but was left basically unscathed by the legal proceedings. Not the case for Weber. Despite Chris having been especially close to Martin since his youth and prior reports of big money changing hands, nothing stemmed from his initial testimony. But in 2002, Martin finally pled guilty to charges that included loaning hundreds of thousands of dollars to Weber and others. Federal authorities thus indicted Weber for lying to the 2000 grand jury. He initially claimed innocence, but eventually admitted to taking money and pled down to criminal contempt, avoiding a prison sentence. NCAA and self-imposed sanctions pushed Michigan basketball to scrub its past. The Wolverines officially vacated a ton of wins from the Fab Five era, pulled down their Final Four banners, and removed Weber's name from individual record books. And there were future sanctions, too. A short postseason ban, but also a 10-year disassociation from Weber and three other players directly implicated in the Martin scandal. No contact, no business, no nothing. So, yeah. The Fab Five legacy is complicated, and it's primarily because of Weber. We should acknowledge that Weber's payment scandal probably wouldn't exist outside an unjust system wherein big-time college athletes receive none of the money that they earn for their schools, but I digress. Anyway, memories of the timeout didn't really dog Weber once his career moved past the immediate aftermath. Weber became comfortable talking about it. He spoke to SI for a big feature just weeks later, and he didn't hear much about the incident once he entered the NBA. Partly because he became a star so fast, partly because he found new drama in the pros. With time, Weber and his family could laugh about that humiliating final moment as a college player. The Ed Martin scandal was a different story. Before confessing in his eventual plea agreement, Weber was adamant about fighting the charges and equally adamant in his disparagement of Ed Martin. Rose and Weber had grown apart, as friends in different cities often do after college, but Chris lying and then lying about lying was, according to Jalen, the final blow to their relationship. But they were still in the league. Rose didn't broadcast his feelings, and Weber certainly wasn't going to talk about that stuff, even years later while signing with the hometown Pistons. There are photos of the two of them together during Weber's forced dissociation from the school, and they even appeared in some of the same TV segments discussing the Fab Five's legacy. While Rose insisted that no sanction could undo the success of those teams, he was clearly bothered by the manufactured distance and the fallen banners. When the Final Four came to Detroit in 2009, Rose and Jimmy King pushed for a Fab Five reunion, but Michigan wouldn't let them do it on campus, and Weber decided not to show up. And then there was the 30 for 30. Rose produced ESPN's 2011 documentary on the Fab Five, which is excellent and worth watching. There were rumors that Weber initially agreed to participate, but ultimately he was the only important member of that team not to. Instead, the movie depended on the other four stars, and Steve Fisher, and upperclassmen like Rob Palinka, all talking about Chris and his mistakes. Toward the end, a school administrator implores Chris to apologize. Chris simply needs to acknowledge that he made a mistake, apologize for those mistakes, and I believe that it would have an enormous impact on our ability to heal this situation and move forward in a very positive way. It feels kind of unfair, but I mean, that's what happens when arguably the central subject of a documentary refuses to be in it. While Weber maintained his distance, Rose kept the floodgates open. In 2013, the Wolverines went back to the national championship. Rose, Howard, Jackson, and King planned to attend the final against Louisville, and on a Grantland podcast, Rose begged Weber to show up too. Chris was the elephant in the room, making any potential reunion weird. Weber did show up, separately. While Rose, Howard, King, and Jackson cheered together in the crowd, the elephant in the room was upstairs in a private suite. Later that year, Weber's 10-year dissociation with Michigan finally ended, but the banners remained in storage, and it was still Rose doing all the talking. He didn't quite say Weber should apologize, but he did say how he would apologize if it were him in Chris's shoes. And on another podcast episode, he and Bill Simmons recounted Weber giving Rose the cold shoulder at the NBA Finals. In 2014, Rose kept addressing Weber publicly as a sort of spokesman for the other Fab Five members, since the whole lineup hadn't truly been together since that fateful night in 1993. And he went further in stating firmly that Weber should do right by his teammates, Steve Fisher, and the now deceased Martin, and apologize. In 2015, Dan Patrick finally got Weber to respond. A lot. 
He talked about the timeout and how it was addressed in the 30 for 30. I've always embraced the timeout. Yeah. I know this, this yeah. Fat Five documentary makes it seem like, oh my God, I'm so scared to talk about it. And he discussed that documentary as a whole. Did you like the Fab Five documentary? Um, I love the guys and I think it's just so much missed. He insisted he'd been down to participate in the doc, but that he'd been kind of ambushed by the interview request. They called and said, you know, hey, we want you to be in the doc. I said, heck yeah, I'll be in the doc. What, what, what's going on? He goes, well, we're wrapping up next week. We need to get you. And I'm like, wait a minute. And he insinuated that Rose had put himself and his fame above the legacy of the whole Fab Five. A lot of people, after they retire, or when they're looking for a job or when they want to be relevant. They embellish. Is, is re- really known. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, my whole thing has been, it's always been about us five, you know. That is a lot. Jimmy King called the bit about the belated interview request a flat-out lie. And Rose came back swinging. I'm just going to read this. One dude traveled, then called time out. One dude lied to a grand jury and hasn't apologized. One dude tried to circumvent the documentary to HBO. One dude ignored multiple requests from everyone involved after agreeing to participate. One dude played like Obama and sat in a suite during Michigan's recent title game. One dude slandered Ed Martin after all he did for him and his family. One dude is not in contact with the other four, which is all good. One dude has been doing a rebuttal doc for four years. One dude clearly is delusional and still in denial. So that is also a lot. When it came back to Chris in October 2015, he was adamant that he didn't want to talk about Jalen anymore. Where are you with Jalen in terms of your relationship? Wherever it was. Uh, I'm, I'm, wherever it was, I mean, you know, the the last time... I mean, Doug, we ain't ain't talking about that. You ain't getting that interview. I'm talking about Wake Forest. This is, I don't talk about him. I talked about him one time on the Dan Patrick show. That was it. But by this time, Rose was promoting a book. A book that told stories of Weber snubbing him and the other Wolverines during his NBA days, not calling people back, flaking on free tickets, flaking on hotel rooms for his friends when he made the All-Star team. And about the documentary, Rose claimed he had initial buy-in from Weber, who then flip-flopped and decided he didn't want to talk about his past, only to go pitch a separate documentary to HBO. Rose even went into greater detail about the time Weber cursed him out at the NBA Finals and finished a long section on Weber by once again asking him to own his transgressions and apologize. That really seems to be Rose's main issue in recent years. He has blamed the continued burial of the Fab Five legacy on Weber, including Coach Fisher's lack of recognition. Because he's on TV, Rose gets asked about this stuff a lot, and he always puts the ball in Weber's court, saying he's still haunted. I think that's something that emotionally still plagues him in a lot of ways. Come home, big fella. The Fab Five brothers love you. The University of Michigan loves you. Let it do what it do. In the meantime, he's out here breaking the play down on national television. Dan Patrick got C. Webb going again in 2018. Weber said he talks to some of the other guys. I talk to Juwan like every freaking other day. Ray and uh, Ray and Juwan I talk to often. I haven't talked to Jalen in a while. Said his feelings about the timeout have been mischaracterized. This whole thing of, oh, he doesn't know, he, he can't come back. He's so hurt about the time he's crushed and mentally he can't be with all five of us. Like, I don't, you know. Tried to explain his seating arrangement at the Michigan-Louisville final. And everybody was saying, well, Chris went up to a suite, he couldn't. Well, on paper, I still was banned from the school. And seconded Patrick's hopes for a Fab Five reunion, but blamed Rose's trolling for the tension. Because I've been trolled, like I think no human in the history of sports has been trolled by, you know, someone that you consider your friend, it's tough. He also went on Sway in the Morning and said something similar, that Rose had broken a code by making their issues public. When he broke that code, you know, to what I feel further his career, that, that, that hurt me as a man. And regarding the trolling accusation, Rose insisted he doesn't want to hash this conflict out in the media, then he hashed it out in the media. I don't need to talk about him to further my career. I don't sell out. I am not a media shield. I do not sell my soul in order to talk about sports on television. And this response to Weber getting made an honorary captain by Michigan football coach Jim Harbaugh definitely seemed like trolling. I'm elated by this news. I'm not surprised by this news. And respectfully, it's calculated. And that's more or less where things stand. 
Weber says he wants to reunite with the Fab Five and get the team's legacy back on track, but he's kind of touchy and wants all that done on his terms. Rose thinks all it will take is Weber apologizing for his mistakes, but he is definitely not catering to Weber's touchiness about those mistakes. It's frustrating that this legendary fivesome fractured at what was once its tightest hinge. But I have faith that these two will one day put aside their differences. They've both said that they can be friends again someday. What will that take? Maybe it's Weber finally releasing a book or documentary that tells his whole side of the story. Maybe it's Rose dialing down the heat a bit or the university relenting in its erasure of Fab Five history. Right now, as I speak to you, beef is keeping them apart. But maybe someday, maybe by the time you watch this, the Fab Five Brotherhood will become whole again. If you want to know about another Michigan-related feud, here's the Jim Harbaugh, Pete Carroll beef history. Or here's another bunch of beef. I don't know, just please click on something. Thank you.